Our reading is from Mark 10, starting with verse 46. They came to Jericho, and as he uh, and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar was sitting by the roadside. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Teacher, Rabbi, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Friends, join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth May the meditations that are in all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God. Amen. So in the weekly lectionary text, we're following along a section in Mark's uh, gospel where Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And in each story through this sermon series and this stewardship time, Something, well, kind of ordinary happens, but Jesus takes the moment to do a teaching that is transformative, that really opens people's eyes, quite literally. Jesus is working in this time to really ground his disciples in love, like our stewardship team, root us in love. And Jesus knows He sees the gathering storm clouds around him, the potential for violence, his own death hangs over him. And so nothing less than love is gonna help his disciples through this next time. And nothing less than love is going to help us as we face the challenges that we face in our own lives and in our own times. So let's follow along and see what Jesus and his words may root in our hearts this morning. So last week, Jesus was dealing with the inflated egos of James and John, if you remember, and he had to teach them that if you want to be a leader, you've got to serve others. You have to be a a servant leader and not lord it over people. This week, the disciples are going to get a chance to apply that lesson, right? A blind man, Bartimaeus, they know his name. He's beside the road when Jesus and the crowd passes by and he's shouting out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I think it was loud. I don't, I don't think he was kind of like, oh, hey, hey, Jesus, son, son of David, could, you, could I talk to you for a minute? No, he's in a crowd. And if we look at the, the Greek behind it, it says he was frenzied. He was again and again in a frenzied way saying these words, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, trying to get attention. Now, if you're walking down the street and somebody's pretty loud and they're saying the same thing over and over again, how do you respond? You start to edge away. I worked in a a homeless shelter and homeless services program for eight years. So when I hear that going on, I spring into de-escalation mode, right? Hey, buddy, you all right? Can we talk? What's going on? What's troubling you, friend? 
Last week I was at the Y. As I was coming in, there was a man being walked out by Andy, the director. This guy was very upset. He was quite loudly telling Andy where he could put various parts of his anatomy. <laughs> and he kept yelling all the way through the parking lot, all the way down to the Montessori school where somebody listened to him rant for a while. I'm sure the kids need a little circle time after that. And I thought, okay, this is like home. Yeah, here in Booth Bay Harbor, people get upset. They have mental health problems and challenges. And sometimes when they're having a bad day, they shout it out walking down the street. So Booth Bay Harbor is no different than Northampton in that regard, or Portland, or ancient Jericho too. So the crowd is warning Bartimaeus, hey, Hey, knock it off. Be quiet. Right, because that always works, right? <laughs> when people are shouting and they're upset, you, you try that when you're having a family argument. Hey, would you just be quiet? <laughs> and what happens next, right? <laughs> Boom! The volume goes up, the intensity goes up, and sure enough, Bartimaeus is turning up the volume. No, son of David, have mercy on me, right? But you got to wonder, like, why didn't they react by thinking, oh, the blind guy, we should get him to Jesus. We should make way for him to go to Jesus. Shouldn't that be what they do? I mean, when someone's crying out, have mercy on me. They're in distress. They're suffering. They need help. It's, it's a call for relief. So why are they telling him to knock it off? Is it not okay to name your suffering in public? Was he making them uncomfortable because of his suffering? I mean, what is Bartimaeus supposed to do? Just accept his suffering and stay in silence or fill out a form for the disciples so he could get disability or something? <laughs> Bartimaeus sees his one chance, his one hope, that something might change for him, he might, be, he might be healed. Maybe this Jesus of Nazareth could make a difference for him. Son of David, have mercy on me. Scholars will point out that this is the first time anyone uses this title for Jesus in Mark's gospel. It's a royal title. It's a thousand year hope that one as great as David will come and set the world right again, the way it should be. Is that why Jesus stopped? To give a sign of promise to the blind man, get this, the blind man who sees who he really is? Now, other scholars think this was a common expression of beggars that, that just like, you know, when you're walking down the street and people kind of go, spare change, spare change. Oh, thank you very much. God bless you. They might say, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. Oh, thank you. You're the Messiah. Thank you. <laughs> Whichever way it is, whatever the meaning is, they're like Bartimaeus. Knock it off. Not the time and place. You're not what's important here. So what does Jesus do? Mark says the first thing Jesus does is to stand still. To just stand still. It's not easy to stand still, is it? He's in a crowd. Crowds, they're, it's surging. It's, it's moving. There's an energy. There's a direction. And suddenly the center of the crowd, he's standing still. Did he raise his hand? 
and have everyone stop and wonder what's going to happen next? Standing still is often the most important thing we can do when the shouting starts, when the crisis begins, because if we're still, we have a moment to see and reflect and think, and then we can choose. If we're not still, we often just react to the moment. Like Bartimaeus, be quiet, right? That's reacting. But Jesus stood still, and that gave him the vision to see what was important right now in that moment. And what he determined was most important was the suffering of one man in that crowd. Oh, I long for the vision, the stillness, to see like Jesus saw in that moment. Call him here, Jesus says. You notice Jesus didn't call Bartimaeus over. He says, hey, buddy, yeah, you, the shouter there in the back. Hey, hey, would you come on over? I want to, yeah, yeah, I want to talk to you. No, he makes the crowd call Bartimaeus. The crowd who had been saying, Bartimaeus, be quiet, suddenly is being asked to call Bartimaeus to Jesus, and their, their tune changes, right? They're like, oh, oh, Bartimaeus, take heart. Take heart, he's calling you. You go to him, take heart. In, in the Greek, that word can mean have courage. Be bold, be audacious, Bartimaeus, and, and, and go to Jesus. Well, he was already being audacious and having courage, wasn't he? They were just finally acknowledging it now that Jesus made him the center of attention. You see how clever Jesus is to enlist the crowd? To get the crowd to welcome and encourage Bartimaeus when they had been excluding him just by making them call Bartimaeus over. So Bartimaeus, he jumps up, he's going to follow, he's, he's stumbling along following the sound to Jesus as quickly as he can. And Jesus says to him something, well, actually a little perplexing. What do you want me to do for you? Really, Jesus? I mean, he's blind. Just, just like heal him. And then we can move on, right? But, but no, he, he asked, what do you want me to do for you? You may remember last week, it's the same question he said to James and John. What do you want? What do you want me to do for you? I think it's a respectful question. It's a question that, that values someone. A powerful question. You may remember last week I said I'm a recovering fixer, meaning I'm trying to learn to understand people before I just jump in and do what I think they need. So when you ask this question, actually, uh, in my favorite book on coaching, it's called The Coaching Habit. This is question number four of seven of the most important questions you can ask. So Jesus is a pretty bright guy, right? <laughs> but the question is, what do you really want? What do you really want? Now, what do you think happens when I ask that question? I ask it a lot. What do you think happens when I'm talking to someone and I say, what do you really want? <clears throat> Most people don't have an answer. They're actually kind of stunned in silence and sometimes their mouth even drops open and then no words come out. And they have to think about it for a minute. Imagine we go through life, we have our challenges and our struggles, and we get frustrated and we get sad and we get angry and, and we want to give up or, or we want to blame somebody and we go through all these things. And when we're asked what we really want, we're not quite sure. And for that matter, how often does anybody ask us what we really want? No wonder we don't know. It's not given space. But sometimes if someone asks you, what do you really want? You, you realize you just wanted someone to listen. 
You just wanted to be validated for what you're going through in that moment. Or sometimes something comes that had been longing to come out. Something you're feeling, something you need to do. Somebody asks you what you really want and it, and it comes out. It's finally expressed and given room is such an important question. It's often the doorway to get out of, of something we're struggling with to first identify what we really want. What would you say if Jesus asked you right now, what do you want? And it'd make a difference what people around you were doing, right? If they're telling you to be quiet, get out of the way, you're not important. Or if they're saying, hey, take heart. Come, take heart, he wants to hear. And, and I think maybe that's what Jesus is trying to teach here. And what the beloved community that we try to live into, we're to be those ones that say to each other, take heart. Be bold, have courage. If you're struggling, if you're frustrated, God is right here, take heart. What do you really want? Bartimaeus knows. Rabbi, I wanna see. Jesus says, go, your faith has made you well. Now isn't that intriguing that he starts the sentence with an imperative, go. Your faith has made you well. Did he say that calmly as in, go in peace, Bartimaeus? Or was it more like a cheer? Go, Bartimaeus, your faith has made you well. It feels a little backwards, doesn't it? Shouldn't Jesus heal him first and then say go? Why does he say go and then your faith has made you well after. And, and so what, at what moment is Bartimaeus, when does he see again? Can, can you identify the precise moment? Because Jesus doesn't put a hand on him and heal him. He doesn't pray over him. There's no liturgy. There's no ritual. He just says, go, your faith has made you well. It seems to me that, that Faith has made you well happens before he sees. So being made well, being made whole, has, it has more, it's more than what happens to your body, right? Wellness isn't just about our body, it's about, it's about our whole selves. Just as sight isn't just about what your optic nerve is doing, it's about what you're open to actually seeing. And I think this passage is functioning both as a healing story, but a parable about who sees and who doesn't see. The blind man sees who Jesus is. The crowd is blind and can't see who Bartimaeus is. And it's challenging us to think about what it means to have vision. You know, some people can be differently abled and they can be blind or deaf or have a chronic illness, and yet they're still well. And some people can have 20-20 vision and they can't see a darn thing. <laughs> they can't see suffering right in front of them. They don't wanna see injustice or poverty or exclusion happening. They don't even know because they can't see. It takes a vision, it takes more than an optic nerve. In order to truly see, it takes a desire, a wanting, it takes faith. It takes a faith that wants to be well in order to truly see. And that's what Bartimaeus had, a faith that made him well, that made him whole, whether he could physically see or not. It, Jesus was just calling it out and naming it and saying, there it is, right there, wholeness, faith. He gives Bartimaeus an agency for his boldness, for his willingness to stand up in the midst of the crowd and call out. And I think of what Jesus said to Doubting Thomas, blessed are those who do not see and yet still believe. 
Rabbi, I want to see. That's my prayer too. My eyes can see with a little help. But if I don't process, if I don't interpret, if I'm not open, if I don't really look, if I don't stop and be still, then I will miss. And I will not have vision. I will not see. We can't see unless we can look at life on life's terms. Or to see as God would hope that we could see. We don't see if we're blind to suffering and injustice. And I think the whole point of religion, the whole point of spirituality, is to learn how to see correctly. To be able to see through the eyes of faith and hope and love. And I think Jesus is the lens that helps us see this God clearly. So I invite you to pray this week. Rabbi, help me see. As that song in Godspell says, day by day, O oh dear Lord, three things I pray, to see thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, to follow thee more nearly day by day. Now go. Your faith has made you well. Amen? Amen. Amen.